Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming and being with us here this morning as we have gathered here for the worship of God. Fathers, happy Father's Day and grandfathers and all of the others who fit that bill. We are glad to, that you are here and get to celebrate with you as well. We're glad that we have all been able to come and gather in this place. If this is your first time here, welcome. You should have a card within your bulletin. Fill that out and take it to the Welcome Center that's right outside this door on this side. And they will have a gift for you there. It'll have a Starbucks gift card in it and several other things as well as some information for you. We hope that you'll go and pick that up. <clears throat> we would also ask you to go to this number and text WELCOME. You'll not only get a welcome, but you'll get some information about upcoming events that are going on in the church that you might want to participate in. And we hope that you will take advantage of that opportunity. But whatever you do, we're glad you're here. We hope that you'll come back and be with us in the days that are ahead. If this is your first time here, I'm Tommy McDear, I'm the pastor of the church, and we're glad to have you in this place. You are about to experience something if this is your first time here that you may have never experienced in church. This is the day of our annual meeting where we are going to be voting on our church budget and our, and our uh, leadership for the year. <clears throat> Excuse me, Chris Kaufman is going to come and lead us through that. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Tommy mentioned, this is our annual meeting. Um, I have the privilege of serving as the, the chair of the leadership council for this year. Um, in just a minute, we're gonna have deacons come up the aisle and they're going to have a green ballot for uh, the members of the church to vote on. So if you're a member, if you would just please raise your hand, they will pass the ballots. On one side, you will find the, um, the summary of the budget for the upcoming church year that starts in September. On the other side, you will find the nomination slate um, for the leadership of the church for next year as well, as long as the ballot. Um, so again, if members, if you would raise your hand, um, they will hand you a ballot when you once you have voted Please pass them to the middle middle of the aisle and they will come back through and collect as well Those of you who are visiting, isn't this fun? Aren't you having a good time? And mark your ballots, pass them to the inside aisle. Or the outside aisle. Yeah. We need a couple of more ballots here for the choir, for someone that has some. Next year, I'll sing something during this. And then... <laughs> we would like some new people running our sound as well, if we have that in there. <laughs> we actually do need volunteers for that. If, you're, if you are available and can help us, in our audiovisual ministry, we are really needing some new volunteers in that. So if you could see Charlotte after the service and she'll get you plugged in where it needs to go. So. All right, have we got everything pretty well gathered? All right. Thank you for participating in this. It is an important element of our annual meeting and so we thank you for that very much. We have just finished, in case you couldn't tell by the decorations on the walls and the hallways, we have just completed Vacation Bible School. Look at this video and you'll see the highlights of that. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. Rescue from the middle of the ocean deep. Rescue from the middle of the ocean deep.
Let's thank all our volunteers who made that happen. It is always a great week when we're able to see those children having fun and, and learning about God in the process, and it takes a lot of people to make that occur. And so we thank you very much for it and for all that they learned during the course of the last five days. We've gathered in this place today to celebrate God's love and God's grace and to be part of what it means to be a family of faith. Let's stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord, and our children can come forward during the singing for our children's time. Let's stand. You know me, but in case you don't, I'm Sarah, and I get to hang out with the youth and the college students the most, so I only get to hang out with y'all when I'm really, really lucky. But today, I'm really, really lucky. And so I have a question for you. How many of you, you can just raise your hand, how many of you have ever built something? Okay. How many of you have built something out of Legos? All right. Out of building blocks? Hmm. How many of you have ever heard, built a house? Anyone? Me neither. I want you to imagine for a minute, and you can just yell out, what are some tools you might need to build a house? A screwdriver. A screwdriver is a good one, Abram. Hammer. Hammer. Yeah, that's, I think, a very important one. Evie? A wrench. Yeah, okay, these are good tools. A drill. A drill. What is the house made of? Bricks or wood. Okay, stone, so you need some type of material. You're right, you need materials to build something. Can you build a Lego tower with no Legos? No. Yes. Yeah, you can, Corlin? You're magical. Perfect. Well, do you know, in Scripture, Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And in Scripture, Jesus tells us that we can each be a part of that. And so we can each be people that help build the kingdom of heaven. And so that means that we can all be people that invite others to share in God's love with us. But I wonder, what kind of tools do you think I might need to build God's kingdom? Some, some hands? Okay, that's perfect. Hands. Evie? A Bible? Let me see if I have a Bible in my tool bag. This is a very fancy, top, state-of-the-art tool bag right here. I do have a Bible, Evie, so that's a good one. What other tools might I need to build God's kingdom? Anything else you can think of? Oh, Evie, got another one? Friends are a good tool. Yeah, so relationships. Abby? God is a very helpful tool in building God's kingdom. Abram? Hell, oh, yes, I always need help. That is so true. Well, I have a couple of other tools that I'm going to use soon to try and help build, God, build God's kingdom. And I want to see if any of them look familiar. So what is this? Yep, I actually have two, a deflated soccer ball. Okay, so I'm going to tell you in just a second why those tools are important. And I have, what are, what are these things? Googly eyes. Okay, so we're going to just say craft supplies. So googly eyes and a paintbrush. And I have notebook and pencil. So some school supplies. We're counting that as school supplies. And I have a book, a story. And so later on in the service day, you might hear about this again, but on Thursday there are 26 people from your church here 
that want to help build God's kingdom somewhere else. So we're going to this little island called the Dominican Republic, and these are the tools that we need to build the kingdom. Because telling the story of Jesus is something that we can do while we help people play sports, and while we do crafts, and while we work on lessons for school. So the place that we're going, one of the gifts that we can offer them is to help them speak English and understand English better. And so, for example, I am very, very bad at sports, and I am a very, very bad artist, but I can sometimes speak English fairly well, and so that's a <laughs> gift I have to offer, right? I'm speaking it right now. So what about you? What are some gifts that you have? So if I can speak English fairly well, do any of these remind you of gifts that you already have or things that you already like to do? What are some things you like to do? Soccer, okay, we have a soccer player? Sports in general? What else? Evie? Music? Oh yeah, I have, oh I forgot to put them in there. I had rhythm sticks to represent music. That's a good one. I'm also not musical, which is why I don't have musical instruments. Abram? <laughs> Crafts? Yeah, and so all of these tools are tools that you can choose to use to also build God's kingdom. And so we certainly can use these things you like to do and not build God's kingdom. You could go to a sports game and have a terrible attitude and be mean to people, and they don't care that you love Jesus or that Jesus loves them. Or we can, in the going ones of our regular life, take the things that we always do and look for opportunities to build friendships, like Evie said, and to share with them about how Jesus loves them. And so there's a verse I'm going to read to you. It's from Colossians, and it's in chapter 3, yep, verse 17. And it says, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so when you are playing on your sports teams, and you are using your art supplies to draw with friends, and you are sharing stories with other people, in those moments, you are getting to help build God's kingdom because you're doing it with words of love, and sometimes with words that tell people about how God loves them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So y'all can all be kingdom builders with me, you think? Yeah? yeah? All right, let's pray. God, I thank you that you have given us things that we love. Um, sharing stories with people, sharing meals with people. Sometimes it's art or sports or music. There's things that we're really good at, and there's things that we aren't so good at, but we might enjoy doing. And yet, God, if we let them be, all of these can be tools to help build your kingdom. And so remind us and show us more and more each day how we can use what we already have to let the world know that you love them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all of the fathers out there. It's wonderful to gather together in the house of the Lord and to offer our sacrifice of praise as we sing. Would you stand and join with us? Oh, four thousand tongues to sing. Oh, four thousand tongues to sing. My praise.
about what to name that baby <laughs> and you know back in that day, back in my day Robbie Edison they didn't do ultrasounds all the time you didn't know what that baby was gonna be until that baby was there so you didn't have to pick out one name you had to pick out two now as a teacher for 24 years I knew how important that was because I taught some kids with some crazy names <laughs> My first year, I had a child named Dusty, which would not be so bad if his last name was not Rhodes. <laughs> I had another child, I can remember the first day of school, and I looked at the name on my roll sheet, and it was spelled A-N-T-I-Q-U-I-N-E. And I thought, oh, I don't want to embarrass this child. And I went, Antoine? His name was Antoine. It was a creative spelling. A name is so important. So important. The name of Jesus is so important. You know, it's more than we can hope or we can imagine. His name is wonderful because it gives us our gratitude for salvation. His name is beautiful because it shares the tenderness of his love. And his name is powerful because he is sovereign and Lord over all. What a beautiful name is the name of Jesus.
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What a wonderful name it is. 
you join me in prayer? Father God, we look around at the remnants of VBS still on our walls, and we know that you are good. You are good because you filled our halls with laughter this week, with love, with enduring patience of so many volunteers. And we are thankful. We are thankful for the ways that we were able to shine light this week and to grow our children even more into your image. God, we give you thanks because you are good in providing for our needs. We have been praying for a family life minister and this week learned officially of Lindsay's coming. And so we give thanks for Lindsay. God, we pray as a congregation that as she transitions into this role of minister and pastor here at BBC, that you will give her the endurance to run the race well, help her to know that she is welcomed and cared for and prayed for already. God, we give you thanks for the team that is going. We give you thanks for opportunities to serve. We have teams that have served in Nicholsville, and we have a team going to the Dominican Republic. And God, it is true that far away and here at home, we get to be builders of your kingdom, and it is a privilege to work with you for your glory. God, we give you thanks when it's hard to give you thanks. For we know that in the moments that we mourn and in the moments that it's hard to understand what your purpose is, that you are still God and you are still good. And God, we give you thanks this morning for fatherhood. We thank you for the men in our lives and in our churches that have been role models for us, that have cherished us and loved us well and built us up and helped us to know what it means to have a strong father. But God, we know that not everyone does. And in those moments, we trust you to be our good father. We lean on the beautiful name of Jesus to fill the spaces in our hearts that sometimes are left gaping open. God, we love you because you have first loved us and you've shown us what it is to be a people of love. And you are true in those things. And God, together this morning, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we also have to fire Charlotte because all during the prayer she was trying to knock my sermon off on the floor. So I was standing up here doing this. And we sure didn't go anywhere. This has been a strange day here at the church. It's been a good day, a very good day. As a matter of fact, the vote, by the way, was unanimous. First time that's ever happened in the known history of the church. So we thank you for that. But uh, we were having our 830 service this morning and I had come in and we had done the welcome and then we did the Vacation Bible School video, and then we did our business meeting, and then I came up to do the invocation, and I told everybody to bow their heads, and when I looked down and bowed my head, I had done all of the beginning of the worship service with my pants obviously unzipped. <laughs> I was at a conference one time, and they were going down the line, they were asking all these pastors who were on this panel, what's the last thing you do before you... Before you preach in the morning and they were saying well I pray or I gather I looked at them I said I check my fly which is what I always did except this morning I didn't do that and it was not a good day for any of us so then while I realized that I reached down while I was praying and zipped my pants and then suddenly realized we live stream these services <laughs> so probably on YouTube before the day's out you will be able to access that it was such a monumental time in my life. Yeah, I've been here 21 years. <laughs> New pastor will take over next week. Oh my. I also have a cold in case you can't tell by this voice. It's not a bad cold at all, but I'm a man, so it will require whining. Steve Morris tells a true story about a teacher who was 
trying to teach her children about different kinds of literature. And one of the examples that she was giving them was that by reading the story of the three little pigs. There was a kid in her class who was a very smart child, but he was also very funny. He was very quick witty. Anyway, the teacher went on. She read the story of the three little pigs. When she got to the part about the first little pig going to the man with the wheelbarrow full of straw, she read that and she said, she got to the part that said, pardon me, sir, might I have some straw to build my house with? And when she got through saying that, she turned around and she looked at little Brendan and she said, Brendan, what do you think that man said in response to that? And the boy said, I think he said, holy crap, a talking pig. We may not be able to predict what kids are going to say and do in their lives, but you can bet your life on one thing. Sooner or later, you're going to get surprised by what they say and do, which is why we need to be careful of what we say and what we do in front of kids. Another true story. Bruce McIver swore that he was at the the party where this happened. Bruce was pastor of Wiltshire Baptist in Dallas for years and years. Well, they all went to this party. This lady had invited people over to, to dinner from her church. The pastor was there. Many of the people from her Bible study group, the woman had been cooking and getting ready for this party all day long. Now they were all gathered there. It was time for them to eat. It was time for the blessing. This mother turned around to her little daughter and she said, Amy, would you like to say the blessing for us? And the daughter said, I don't know what to say, mama. And the Mother looked at their daughter and said, Honey, just say what you've heard Mama say. And so Amy bowed her head and said, Lord, why did I invite all these people over here? I don't even like some of these people. (laughs) Be careful what you say and do in front of children. Because I can tell you, as a father who has screwed up more than once, you will harvest what you plant, no matter what it is. That's exactly what Jesus is trying to get across in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. What we say and what we do can make a difference in life because sometimes it's the smallest of things that make the biggest difference. Our Scripture today comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. Hear these words this morning. Jesus also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say that the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows. It becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Jesus was telling this story 2,000 years ago, he used the example of a mustard seed because it was the smallest seed in the ancient world, and yet it grew the largest plant in the garden that they would have back in that day and time. My guess is if Jesus were telling this same story today, he might use a giant sequoia tree as an example. The sequoias that you find in the Sequoia National Park in California are the largest trees in the world, and the biggest sequoia in that park is named the General Sherman. This tree is the largest living thing on the face of the earth. It's 275 feet tall. It's 102 feet around at its base. It's estimated to weigh approximately 2,750 tons. But what's interesting is, even though these trees are the largest living creatures that you can find in the world, a sequoia tree seed is about the size of an oak flake. This giant tree comes from one of the smallest seeds in the world. Jesus didn't have a giant sequoia, so he used a mustard seed and a mustard tree to give his example, but the point is still exactly the same. The little things in life matter, period. 
What we say and what we do will be like seeds planted in the hearts of our children and our grandchildren and the people that we are trying to influence for God in our lives. And sometimes it's the small stuff that makes all of the difference. Watch this. not very often that it's the biggest things that happen in our lives that make us choose our purpose. It's usually a conglomeration of the small things. If you think about it, that's not what we're called to do with our children is to set huge examples. But we're called with the, to be with both our children and the children of the church to be the kind of examples that Jesus taught his disciples to be. Jesus used words and then he, took them on a, then he took his disciples on a three-year journey so they could see the faith that he was talking about come to life. And then, once he had spent that time trying to teach them with his words and with his actions how they were supposed to live and serve, then he told them, go and do likewise. He wanted them to imitate what he did. It was sort of an adult version of the old game Show and Tell. I used to love show and tell day at school. I'd try to come up with the strangest things that I could find, and I'd take them to school, and I'd either amaze people or I'd gross them out. That worked really well until one day I took something dead to school. It was either a dead bird or a dead frog. I can't remember which one, but anyway, my teacher was not impressed at all, and so she called my mother, and that pretty much ended my show and tell days. Jesus didn't do weird show and tell kinds of things, but he certainly knew how to do amazing show and tell kinds of things. Things like walking on water or feeding the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish or healing people or raising people from the dead or stopping an angry mob from stoning a woman to death using absolutely nothing but his words to do it. Or maybe that thing called the resurrection, you know, that was a big show and tell day as well. Jesus certainly knew how to make the most of show and tell day because Jesus knew that entire game was about planting seeds that would grow into something that would become big in our lives. So, given our scripture that I read to us a few minutes ago, how do we go about doing what God would have us do? Well... I think the way that we do that is by matching our words to our actions. I've heard preachers over the years say things like, our sermon should be our lives. Or they've quoted St. Francis of Assisi when he said, preach the gospel at all times when necessary use words, which would be great, except St. Francis never said that. We don't know who did say that. And on top of that, it's not actually biblical. Our lives need to match our words, but Jesus was a preacher. He went from town to town teaching about the kingdom of God. He didn't just go from town to town doing good things. Anybody can do good things, but the way people know that you're doing good things for God is we tell them. Why? Because people can't read minds. 
They can't read our minds. We can't read theirs. No one else can at all. We have to tell them why we're doing the things we're doing. A piece of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life that a lot of the secular world doesn't notice is that he counts everything he did in Jesus' name. Dr. King never once referred to himself as a social activist. He was a Christian minister who believed that the Christian faith was about salvation and social justice. Dr. King never made a single speech about racism and social change that wasn't a sermon that focused on faith. Even his great I Have a Dream speech was a sermon that quoted scripture all the way through it. Doing good deeds is wonderful, but there's nothing inherently Christian about doing good deeds. And I've never seen anybody become a Christian believer just because they saw somebody doing something nice. People become believers because our actions and our words come together as one. And you really can't pretend one's more important than the other just because you're more comfortable doing one than you are doing the other. Or to say it a different way, you have to walk the talk and talk the walk. If you walk the walk, but you don't tell people any, don't tell anybody at all what you're doing and why you're doing it, they'll think that you're a nice person. They just won't know why you're a nice person. If you talk the talk, but your walk stinks, they'll know that you're a hypocrite and they won't pay any attention to what you say. You have to walk the talk and talk the walk if you want the world to take your faith seriously. And more often than not, the way you do that is through the little things, the mustard seed kinds of things. Not many of us are going to end up being the leader of something like the civil rights movement. Not many of us are going to be Billy Graham who's going to preach in, in giant arenas to thousands of people at a time. Not many of us are going to be a, a Christian present, president with world influence like Jimmy Carter has been. Not many of us are going to be Mother Teresa who's going to start a worldwide movement in ministry to the poor. Not many of us are going to have Christian influence on a giant scale like that. Most of us are going to make a difference one person at a time. We're going to plant small seeds of faith through the things we say and the things that we do. Let me give you an example. I became a Christian because of one phone call that lasted less than five minutes. Pastor of the church heard that I was having some personal problems. He heard that some of those problems were faith problems, so he got on the phone and he called me one day when I was 16 years old and he asked if we could meet and talk and I can't say that I was really excited about meeting with the pastor, but I agreed to meet with him and talk and we met that day. We met a few other times after that and by the time we got through with all of it, I had given my life to Jesus Christ. One phone call that lasted less than five minutes ended up being the catalyst to change my life forever. It wasn't the Civil Rights Movement, it wasn't Billy Graham, it wasn't Mother Teresa, it wasn't even the day of Pentecost. It was one phone call by one man who is never going to be famous, and most people outside of his churches that he served will never know who he was. That man led me to faith, he led me to the ministry, he gave me my first opportunity to preach and teach. He taught me more about personal outreach than I learned from any seminary class that I ever took. He ordained me to the ministry the largest church that he ever pastored in his life was about half the size of our total attendance here. And yet one phone call changed everything for one young man. John Allen planted one small seed with one short call and my life was never the same again because it led me to Christ and Jesus gave me my life. Occasionally it's the big stuff that'll make the huge difference but the Christian faith has become the dominant faith of the world because of the big things that have happened. It's become the dominant faith of the world one life at a time, one word at a time, one act at a time <clears throat> through the presence of the Holy Spirit coming to one soul to the next over and over and over again planting faith the size of a grain of mustard seed in the souls of everyone around them and those grains of mustard seed have made all of the difference. I'm sure that you have heard 
of Bethany Hamilton. You may not ring a bell right off the top of your head who she is, but I think if you watch this video that I'm about to show you, you'll, you'll know who she is. And when you do, we'll talk about why I've shown this. Halloween of 2003, I was 13 years old and I was surfing with my best friend. It was like a picture perfect morning. It was beautiful out and the water was just crystal clear blue. We were just surfing, waiting for waves and I was kind of sitting out further than everyone else and um, within a split second, the shark came and took my arm. I didn't really have time to think much. Right away, I just knew I had to get to the beach just to survive this. Immediately, my friends came and helped me. And I just kind of laid there and just prayed the whole way in, just um, asking God for help. I had lost about 60% of my blood, and as I was getting into the ambulance, there was a local paramedic, and he whispered in my ear and said, God will never leave you nor forsake you. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was about five years old, and being able to turn to Jesus during this crazy moment in my life it gave me a sense of peace and calmness, and I think that's one thing that just kept me alive. I'm 13, I have dreams and goals, and I was doing really well with surfing. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to surf again or not. From what seems like such a horrible thing, God has just brought glory to himself through me and um, I've been able to just be a good light to people and share his love. I wake up every day and honor God in everything that I do and I may fall short sometimes, but all I want to do is love him. My name is Bethany Hamilton and I am second. You may not have remembered her name right off the bat, but after seeing her story, my guess is you remember her. Bethany has spoken all over the world. She is not only a world champion surfer, something she always wanted to do, but she has told her story of this tragedy that came her way all over this planet. She has preached and taught in various churches and, and tried her very best to lift God up in that process. Most of us, once we have seen something like this, remember her story we know who she is but what we don't know is the name of the paramedic who whispered words of hope into her ear that day i've heard bethany tell this story before and she's told in a great deal more detail and after having lost 60 percent of her blood volume she was convinced that she was dying and she was actually praying for god to take her soul and when she heard this paramedic lean down in her ear and say, God will never leave you nor forsake you. And those words gave her the strength to rally and to fight and to start living a, a life that would eventually count for God in powerful ways. Anybody could have whispered encouraging words in her ear that day. And there were lots of good paramedics, far more than one that were there with her that day who was who were bringing their medical skills to bear on the wounds that she had to try to take her through that terrible time. But only a paramedic of faith could bring words and actions for God to create the ultimate gift of hope in a situation like she was sitting in that day. It was a hopeless situation until she heard those words. Only a person of faith could believe that one phone call or eight words whispered in the ear of someone at just the right time could become the miracle of life to change everything. But even a small seed of faith planted in the right soil at just the right moment can become the power of life in this world. But you have to have faith to give faith. 
You have to have at least that mustard seed size of faith in your soul to be able to share something powerful with the world around you. You have to start by giving your life to Jesus. And then when you do, he takes those circumstances. And he takes what little we can bring, eight words, one phone call, and he shifts things completely. Today our Lord has come to this place and he wants to be first in our hearts and he wants us to be second right behind him offering the best we can to a world who doesn't believe that there is any hope. But there is. And it's Jesus. And if we'll believe and give our lives to him, those little mustard seeds of faith will grow into something magnificent. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask you to come. I ask you to come and to be here in this place with us. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your strength. Some of us have come here today because we have had faith for a very long time. We believe in you. We believe in what you can do, not only for us and in our lives, but what you can do through us for the world that's around us. Some of us have come here because we have doubt in our hearts and we're not sure how to overcome it, and we're terrified for anybody to know that we have those doubts. Some of us have come here because we're just not sure we believe anything and, and we want to believe. That's why we've come here, because we want to find our purpose and we don't know what it is. Lord, come to us today. And kindle that sense of faith down within our souls. It doesn't matter how big it is. It can be as small as a tiny sea. You can take what we bring to you and you can turn it into life. Give us the courage to come to you and say, Father, come into my life and make me the person that you want me to be. I don't have a lot of faith to bring you, but I'm bringing what little I've got. And I'm trusting you, Lord, to take what I bring to you and to grow it into something stronger and something better and something more powerful. Give me my purpose in life, O oh Lord, and help me to live it as best I can. And help me to know that by living it day in and day out, in whatever situation we find ourselves, even in the midst of tragedy, we can whisper those few words of life into an ear, and life will become different. Come to us today, O oh Lord, and help us to become different. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. In the garden of our Savior, no flower grows unseen. His kindness reigns like water on every humble seed. No simple act of mercy escapes his watchful who sees me. His hand is over mine. In the kingdom of the heavens, no suffering is unknown. Each tear that falls is holy. Each breaking heart of
This you have asked of us Through little things with great love This you have asked of us Through little things with great love Little things with great love At the table of our Savior No mouth will go unfed And his children in the shadows stream come here today and you have at least a mustard seed sized grain of faith that you would like to bring to Jesus Christ, we would invite you at the close of the service to come. We would love to have you as a candidate for baptism. If you want to join this church and be part of this fellowship, we would love to have you do that. If you'll come at the close of the service, we will help you with that as well. We have a very special moment that is about to come here. Sarah Hubble is going to take us through this an adult or a youth that will be serving in the Dominican Republic, will you please come stand up here with me? Don't look so eager to have everyone looking at y'all. <laughs> Perfect. So I know that y'all have read in the bulletin and in the emails that we're sending a team to the DR. I want to very briefly um, tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing there. So we are going to be serving for two weeks with Project Esperanza, which is an organization that a tech alumni actually started. And um, if you are familiar at all with that island, Dominican Republic and Haiti share an island, and Haiti's often in the news as a area that gets hit by natural disasters and um, is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And so because of that, several, um, several, many, many Haitians have crossed over into the DR and have tried to make a better life for their families there. However, there has a long hundred year um, issue with some racism and some justice issues there that have made it very hard for the Haitian immigrants to make a life there. And so what this organization, Project Esperanza, has done, has um, planted in the DR specifically to help these Haitian um, descended people have an opportunity for a hand up so that they can start to work themselves out of permanent poverty. And um, what I really love about this organization that we're working with is they are, the um, woman that started it, Caitlin, is a believer in Jesus, and they are eager to share Jesus' hope, but are also meeting some true social needs. But they also don't only open their school up to the Haitians. They want to see reconciliation in their community, and so people of Dominican descent are also offered um, the opportunity to partake in their services. And so they've started two schools now, and in the summers, they do English camp for their children so that they don't lose the skills they learned the year before, before starting their next year of school, since they're learning in a language that's not um, their primary language. And so what our youth and adults have been doing is been planning the first two weeks of their English camp this summer, where we'll be doing crafts and stories and um, all the music and sports and things like that so that we can be working with these children, sharing that we love them because Jesus loves them, but also learning from them about what it is to live in a place that's different than here. Um, and my hope is that our students and our adults don't just come back it, um, realizing how much they have here and grateful for that, but realizing that you can have a true sense of joy and a true sense of being a follower of Jesus with much less than what our culture says you need. And so I think it'll be a great time of learning, a great time of serving, um, and our prayer is that God is magnified in everything that we say and everything that we do. And so um, 
I want to say thank you to you. We commissioned them in front of you because we couldn't do this without you. Um, and by that, I mean, obviously, the finances, our parking fundraiser is such a blessing to us. And Dave Reddick and Robert Schnitt work their tails off so that our students can go on mission, but they're not the only ones that do. Um, we are thankful because if you have been their Sunday school teacher or their mom or their missions leader, they understand what it is to be a follower of Jesus because of what you taught them. And so you go on mission with us. And we trust that as we go, you will be praying. And when we get back, you will be eager to help us process and to hear our story. So thank you, Blacksburg Baptist, for being on mission with us as we go to the DR. Um, and so if you will commit to praying for our team while we're gone, we'll be in the DR from, July, or no, from June 22nd through July 7th, will you please just raise your hand where you are? So friends, in the moments that we're weary, we know that our people support us and love us well. And so to commission them out, um, I'm going to read a scripture that they all signed as part of a team covenant, committing to how they will treat each other and treat the people that we interact with on the field. And then I will um, say a prayer over them. So from Colossians chapter three, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called to one body, and be thankful. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. In whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all to the name of the Lord Jesus. Will you all pray with me? God, we are a people that bloom where we're planted and seek to reach those in our neighborhoods with the good news that Jesus offers. And we are people that are people of the Great Commission that are sent to go to the ends of the earth. And here and when we go, we pray that you bless this, that where we plant mustard seeds, you grow strong plants. That where we plant sequoia seeds, that something takes root and grows up for your kingdom. And so, God, we pray for safety. We pray for families that are nervous being left behind. God, we pray for those in the DR that will teach us. We know that our hearts will be broken and grown through this process, and we trust that in that we will know your love even better. Thank you for being a God that gives so generously. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thanks for coming.